For USCfootball.com, I'm Keely Yor here with Dan Weber for instant analysis of USC's 49-24 Holiday Bowl loss to Iowa. This is USC's worst bowl loss since the 1948 Rose Bowl. And Dan, talking to you coming into this game, we both thought this was going to be a close game no matter what, given what we've seen from Iowa's offense. But this was the most points that Iowa's offense scored this whole season. I know it's something no one could have predicted, but what were your takeaways from this game? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think you would have found one person rooting for or maybe playing for Iowa who would have thought they could have put up 49 points. I mean, I, I just think it's it's stunning. Uh, you know, looking at their season, looking at everybody they played, they haven't had a game like this. And I think you've got to attribute that to a USC defense that just didn't have a clue, didn't seem to be in the game at all. Is it the five-week layoff with uh, 11 practices in that time? And most of them when you're not really tackling. Uh, yes, he looked like they were in slow motion. I thought the interesting, one of the interesting differences in the game is whenever you got an Iowa player singled up with a USC player, they made the tackle. I don't know how often did you see when the reverse of that happened that the USC player made the tackle. I mean, there were just, you know, missed tackles. I mean, I think the first time Iowa had third and long, they ran a, an off tackle uh, delay play for like 19 yards where they just sort of had the idea that whoever gets a shot at our guy is going to miss him. And that's what, exactly what happened. Same thing on the on the long touchdown, uh, kickoff touchdown yeah. return. Just missed tackles, only a couple of USC guys even in, in position, and, uh, and they couldn't make the tackle. Uh, I think practicing tackling probably really works. I mean, watching Iowa the other day just for 15 minutes, and they were in shorts and helmets and uh, shoulder pads, they were tackling. They were tackling. They were doing a number of tackling drills and tackling to the ground. I mean, I'm trying to remember the last time we saw a USC tackle to the ground. I think it was in August. Uh, that stuff catches up with you. Yeah, yeah. Now, this was a microcosm of the issues that have plagued USC all season long, specifically looking at the defense, uh, misdirection, a trick plays, and perimeter defense. It looked like Iowa definitely studied the film and knew exactly what they were going to do against this USC defense. Oh, they were. It was spectacular uh, how well they were prepared for the USC. I mean, they could formation USC in the first downs. I mean, they would run plays where by formation, they only had to make one block to get to the edge. I mean, they had one block, and, you know, the first two touchdowns they scored, the guy literally walked into the end zone. There wasn't anybody close enough to make them actually have to run all the way into the end zone. First time they ran into the end zone was on the 98-yard kickoff return. But uh, they were just so well prepared. I mean, that is a really, really well-coached football team. I think they thought they had to be. I think they thought they were really in danger with USC just scoring too many points. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it looked like there was going to be that kind of back and forth, but uh, eventually it catches up with USC often where, I mean, you know, they were lucky tonight. You know, Iowa made more, you know, committed more penalties than USC. That's rare for Iowa. But uh, USC, with that defense tonight and the way special teams play, uh, you can't beat a good team. You can't begin to beat a good team. And the stunning thing was USC comes out of the game after the game. Um, we're hearing Clay saying they're going to learn a lot from this game. Uh, the foundation is set. This is going to be a very good team next year based on this game. And I tried to ask the kids, you know, what did you take away from this game? What did you learn from this game? Uh, it's going to help you get better next year. Or, or do you just get better? I mean, you watch the film and you get better. I'll tell you this. Iowa doesn't just watch films and get better. Iowa does things in practice to get better. The things USC does not do. They move. They, they work on their lateral quickness. They, again, work on tackling. And uh, stuff we don't see US, USC do. They watch films and they identify mistakes and they think that that's so you saw what you did don't do it again oh. can I practice it well we don't really practice that kind of stuff we leave it to the games and when the game you know from week to week sometimes that doesn't hurt you when you're going from one Saturday to the next and you haven't tackled between but when the last Saturday was five weeks ago that's a long time to yeah. go between yeah. tackles 
and uh, I think it showed tonight. Yeah, well, when talking about USC fans, this was essentially the worst case scenario, maybe for Mike Bone as well. You bring back Clay Helton and they get blown out in the bowl game. You talk about what Clay Helton said that they need to do to get better, but we've been hearing that same story for him, from him for weeks on end. How do you trust what he's saying and how he evaluates what needs to happen going forward? Yeah, I mean, 11 practices in five weeks, that's just not enough. I mean, I'm sorry. You can't take off two weeks. I mean, they had a chance to practice the last week of the season, which was their bye week, and they didn't do anything. I mean, basically, well, they said they, you know, had two developmental workouts that none of us were allowed to be around for, and they didn't categorize them as, as workouts. They could have worked out all week. And uh, you can tell Iowa, I mean, Iowa is devastated if they don't get all their practices in and how much they – they need those practices to develop uh, players. And uh, we just don't get that same sense uh, with USC. I mean, like today, every time, you know, Iowa, they hit them third and long a number of times in the first half. And basically, Iowa converted every single one of those. Every single one. I guess uh, the one time they got it to fourth down and they converted that. But basically, USC didn't stop them once. Uh, in the first half, they couldn't get off the field. And John Houston said that was a big focus was getting off the field, and they didn't do it once. Yeah. I don't know how you <clears throat> learn when the thing you're trying to do that you have an opportunity to do, you can't do. Uh, you know, what do you say? Just don't do that again? Next yeah. time, do it better? I mean, that's what we were hearing is from the players is, well, we're just going to have to do it better next time. And you want to say, how do you plan to do that? How do you get better? Do you have to do something to get better? I think we know what Iowa is doing, yeah. but I don't know that we ever get the answer is, what's the answer for USC? Yeah. Now, it seems like a question for the coaches as well, but we didn't get to talk to many defensive coaches um, today going out of the tunnel, but uh, Clay Hilton was asked about staff changes, and he reiterated what he said prior to the bowl game, that he's been focused on preparing for the Holiday Bowl, uh, but he said that he's going to re reevaluate everything. He thanked uh, President Carol Fold and Athletic Director Mike Bone for their support and said that he's going to evaluate everything. People seem to think that there will be changes coming forward based on what we've heard from, from Clay Hilton and, and Mike Bone in their statements. What do you think? What do you predict going forward? I predict that if you evaluate things the way um, uh, A.D. Bone and President Folt did in terms of the head coach, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of evaluating going on. Although, we certainly understand that the players think some of their coaches aren't going to be back. However, they also thought that about Clay, and Clay's back. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you certainly have, have gotten the indication that a couple of the coaches whose units really did not perform well tonight uh, may be on the chopping block. But again, you know, that, <laughs> I mean, as much as you hear that, you don't, you're not going to hear that any more than you heard it about Clay last year or this year. So, you know, we understand Clay fought hard to make sure that Clancy uh, didn't get the ax last year. And I don't know. If Clay's thinking tonight, gee, I wonder if I should have fought so hard. Uh, it, it was just uh, not a good performance by, let's face it, the two most at-risk coaches are, are defense coordinator Clancy, Pen Clancy Pendergast and, uh, and uh, special teams coordinator John Baxter. And neither one of them had a unit that, that did anything almost well. The, we'll give them the, the onside kick. Yep. That was great execution, great job. That's the kind of stuff. But you got to do more than one thing. And that becomes almost a footnote because it didn't matter, as it turned out. You know, just didn't matter. USC had a couple of chances to go ahead. Yeah. Nothing happened. Yeah. Now, you mentioned at one point it looked like it was going to be a shootout. But then, as we haven't mentioned yet, Keaton Slovis came out of the game injured. Uh, Clay Helton did say uh, in post game that they believe it is an elbow sprain, but they, they're going to get an MRI. He said they hope it's a sprain. Um, so we'll see the severity of that going forward. Um, but obviously, you lose momentum when your starting quarterback goes out. Uh, it was a, it was a, actually a good moment from the Trojan faithful. Clay Helton actually pointed to Matt Fink and said, you're going in. And the USC fans actually cheered super loud for him. So it was a nice moment for Matt Fink. But still, uh, not what USC wanted to see as far as offensive performance once he did come in. You know, uh, having to bring in your backup brings me to a, just a little point, the kind of things that Iowa does so well. I hadn't seen this before. Every time out, they put both quarterbacks with receivers on the field, and that's the only time you can get on the field during the game, and you have these super long two-and-a-half-minute timeouts. <laughs> and so 
both quarterbacks for Iowa are throwing the ball back and forth uh, to receivers. And if, you're, if they have to put their backup in, he's been throwing the ball the whole game on the field. Uh, they just have a ton of little things like that that Iowa does, that they've really thought about it. They're really smart about it. I mean, for example, when Iowa comes on the field, you got 100 guys in a, you know, a little bit of a square that might be uh, 15 feet by 15 feet. When USC comes onto the field, they strung up, they, you know, they're strung out for, you know, 100 guys over, you know, 200 feet and guys straggling along and all that. Just all the little things that, that just show you Iowa. It reminds you of what, uh, what it used to be like when, when Concord de La Salle would play other just regular high school teams. And they were so much better prepared, so much better coached. And here you've got Iowa that shows up at practice with so many more you know, staffers than USC has at a practice. And then you're going to go your next game, you're playing Alabama. And they show up with a whole lot more people, and it's a whole lot more yeah. serious effort that they put into football than, than USC does right now. And uh, this is kind of a, you know, they keep talking about more resources and all that. I'm not sure that the people at USC that are talking about more resources uh, really know what, what they're exactly talking about. And uh, a couple of times today after the game, Clay said, you know, that's going to enable us to go from good to great. And you said, really? There's something happen that's happening right now that's going to enable USC to go from good to great. And, you know, he said, uh, this was a strong finish. And you think, well, you're going to be 8-5. and five and your 22nd rank, this game probably drops them out of the top 25, I would think. Uh, and I'm not sure if you get beat by uh, 25 points and the biggest bowl loss since 1948. I don't know, does that still qualify for a, a, a strong finish? You yeah. lost one by, uh, what was the, I, I mean, what was the uh, Oregon game? They lost Ooh. that one by 32 or whatever it yeah. was. Uh, I'm not sure that qualifies when the two good teams that you played in the last uh, seven games just smoked you. Yeah, well, in that sense, it seems like this is going to be a long off season for USC, given the fact that Alabama is looming. Uh, and then both coaches and players said prior to this game that it was so important to finish strong, and they didn't. I mean, where do you go from here? I think you, you make empty promises, and you say, we're going to get better. I'm not sure how, but uh, we're going to get better. Uh, we laid the foundation. And I'm, how do you say, after that performance, that somehow you laid down a strong foundation. Really? The Oregon game, this game, I'm sorry. I don't know about that foundation, Coach, but yeah. that's what, that's what we're, we're, you know, we're treated to after a game like this. It, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, yeah. It's almost like we're going to be better because we really hope we're better or we really think we're going to be better or we really told them to be better. And, and you talk to the kids, and they really do want to be better, I think. But all they just say is, we've really got good players on defense. We really have. You can just see them. And then say, but 49 to 24, what, what does that say? And we just have to tighten things up a little bit, or we just have to, OK. It's a culture thing. It's definitely top down. Um, as far as draft eligible players, the only one we got to talk to today was uh, Austin Jackson. He said he still hasn't made a decision yet. He has to sit down with his family and rest his body a little bit. He's a little banged up there. What did we preview that matchup between him and AJ Epinesa? What did you see from that matchup? I think he did pretty well, mostly. And as he said, I believe I heard that he said the only play they're going to remember is the one where he got beat. Yeah. And uh, you know that was maybe a play where you could. Um, have hoped that Keaton stepped up into the pocket a little bit more, or was a little more aware of the uh, the route that Epinesa took to him, or, or whatever. Uh, the other, you know, time that Epinesa got to Keaton, I don't know what happened. It just it looked like he was passed off, and, and it just seemed like confusion of some sort. But uh, I I would think Epinesa, this is good for his draft status. Uh, I'm not sure if it's as good for Austin. Yeah. It's hard to believe that this is the last instant analysis, the last game of the 2019 season. Uh, we started off in fall camp. Uh, first game of the season, JT Daniels goes down. Uh, Keaton Slovis emerges as the star. What do you make of the season overall, looking at a, a broader view? Well, I think they basically told us where this season was going with the loss at Brigham Young. They had no business losing that game. 
uh, no matter what. And uh, I don't think they were as prepared that, hey, we can do things, you know, this is what we can do against these guys. We've got better players. We're going to do it. You don't lose that game. And then they go into Washington, and I think they actually thought Washington was better than they were, and obviously Washington wasn't, although on a night like this, you're not sure what, what even to say about USC. But if you are prepared well enough for those two early games, you go into Notre Dame, and maybe you don't go in half, you know, kind of hesitant that first half. Yeah. And maybe, you know, at the end, you got a chance to win that game. There are just a lot of little things that, that just didn't set this team up right. And then, you know, you've got the excuse. You've got the uh, excuse, you know, the uh, injury excuse. And I know people at USC uh, who are making decisions are saying things like, this could have been Clay's best coaching, uh, you know, year. And I know that t some people I say, oh, man, I hope not. Uh, but if that's the case, uh, then, uh, then do you get to be nationally championship uh, competitive uh, with, this, uh, with this program right now? I don't know that you do. I mean, does this administration want to be uh, nationally competitive? I, given the resources and whatnot, I know Clay Helton said that there's a, a new a resurgence of resources, but do you feel like that's the, the goal of this administration? Well, you can put out a lot of resources. How's that going to get you any more players? Yeah. I mean, if you couldn't recruit any players this year, you think Clay won't be on the hot seat next year? I mean, <laughs> I mean, how does he get off the hot seat between now and that Alabama game? And if you don't win that Alabama game, where does that put him next yeah. year for recruiting? So can you have a couple of back-to-back, -back, uh, you know, blanks? I don't, you know, you better not. But uh, I think they're really, uh, I was thinking about Mike, Mike Bone watching that game finish and thinking, what must he be thinking? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, not anything good. Yeah, yeah. Hard to end the season so doom and gloomy, but this is what happens when it's a, a blowout loss, the worst bowl game a loss since 1948. But I guess any final thoughts, Dan, before we wrap it up here for the 2019 season? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 somebody said, and I thought it was good, they said, uh, and I'll give credit to uh, uh, not my thinking, but they said, who's coaching this team? Uh, Bill Murray? It's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. And it is like Groundhog Day. We've been here before. It feels like you're going to be here again. Uh, uh, you get the same answers. You get a lot of the same uh, uh, same results. And uh, they're not good enough to beat good teams now uh, unless something really fluky, strange, odd happens. And uh, that's not good enough. Yeah. They're not getting better. I don't think they're getting – they're getting better in the basics of, of college football, the blocking, the tackling, the physicality, uh, you know, the just the – just – the lateral quickness that you watch uh, uh, somebody like Iowa work on. And they're not doing it with better athletes, but boy, they're better coached. And uh, they're much more fundamentally sound. And it's like, you know, well, what happened on pass defense? Well, we had to do some things and we were playing man to man and our guys just kept getting beat. Well, you, you know, but, but then in the same th tone you say, oh, but they're all young guys and they're really going to be good next year. Well, they didn't get good by the end of this year, but by next year, somehow, by osmosis or something, they're going to get good? Uh, I don't think so. But, I mean, how many times they're playing man did you see a guy even have an idea where the ball was? No. They didn't. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, uh, and so uh, some, some things have to happen to turn them around. Maybe, maybe somebody is watching this game and watching this film and saying, you know what I was doing? Why don't we do that? You know, maybe we ought to coach them as seriously as Iowa coaches them up. And maybe we ought to consider ourselves a developmental program like Iowa does. Because Iowa says we probably can't, you know, recruit with the big guys, but we can develop the heck out of them and we can coach the heck out of them and we can be serious and we can really work hard and we can get stronger and tougher and, uh, you know, watch them tackle versus how USC tackles. It's not even close. No. I mean, there's so much more uh, sound fundamentally. And uh, there's no excuse for that. Yeah. None. Z zero. In that sense, do you think uh, staff changes, potential staff changes, could affect the culture, make this team better? We've seen that happen with Graham Harrell and what he did with this USC offense this season. Or does this start with the head coach? Is this top down? 
I don't think you can avoid the head coach part of it. I mean, obviously, Graham made a big difference. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew how to do it. He knew how to handle the coach, uh, the uh, quarterbacks and the wide receivers. And I think that part of it worked. But, you know, he wasn't, you know, running the offensive line, for example. He wasn't running the running backs. Uh, what did they get, 22 yards today net uh, yeah. running the ball? I mean, come on. That's, that, that's not acceptable in any game. Uh, so, yeah, I think that unless the head coach uh, – understands what they have to do and make sure they do it. I mean, let's face it, the two things Clay was going to be in charge of this year were cutting back on penalties and, uh, and turnovers. And how'd that go? Yeah. You know, so uh, that wasn't even a whole lot of things. That was just two very basic things and uh, no improvement at all, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so I think, you know, unless the head coach has some kind of epiphany, uh, it's hard to see, even if you bring in a new defensive coordinator, even if you bring in a new special teams guy, you can improve incrementally. Uh, can you improve enough? You know, if you don't practice hard and if you don't, uh, if you think by showing it on film and talking about it instead of doing it is enough to make you better, you're probably not going to get better. Yeah. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up from here in San Diego. And also for the 2019 season, just want to thank you guys on behalf of me and Dan for watching us all season long. We love giving you guys the reports, the practice reports, game uh, analysis. So thanks for watching all year. We'll be back. Uh, but that's going to wrap it up for the 2019 season. For Dan Weber, I'm Keely Orr. For more, check out uscfootball.com.